uh, if you have your Bibles, I want you to open them up to Ephesians chapter five, uh, chapter 6. We've been working our way through Ephesians chapter 5, and uh, we're going to take a peek at a few verses in chapter 6 today. We're going to take a look at one of the most difficult yet rewarding things in life, and it is the issue or privilege, however you look at it, of parenting. We have to take a look at what it means for God's design to be a parent. I want you to think about this with with me for a moment. Why in the world do you think that God has built youth and the growth pattern from really birth through death? Why do we grow? Why is there a maturity? In other words, why in the world didn't God build a scenario where you and I, just when we're born, we're automatically adults, we're, we have some smarts about us, we don't have to be trained, we're automatically up and ready to go. Why in the world would God create a scenario where you have to give birth in pain to a child who will become a pain in the future, and it gets into their teenage years and is a special person in your home, it's like from birth through the time when you kick them out of the nest, there's this whole gradual process that has to happen for you and your child. Why would God build a scenario like that where you as a parent have to train your child for years and years and years? Many of us we haven't had a job for, tw- you know, we haven't been in our job for 20 years. Some of us have had the privilege of, of staying at our job for, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years. That doesn't happen much anymore. But I want you to realize this. When you have a child, you are now called to have this job for the next 20 years. For some of us, our kids are still hanging on. For 25, 30, 40 years, Johnny, you're 58, playing video games in the basement. It's time to get out and leave, fly on and get a job. For many of us, our parenting has been the biggest challenge of our lives. So let's look at what God has for childhood. And if you don't have children now, if your children are already gone, this is maybe when you look back and go, you know what? There were things that uh, I really regret about how I raised my kids. And you don't want to do that maybe for your grandkids. Or if you're young, single, and you're like, kids are a long way off for me, realize this. God often has a different plan than we do for your kids. Sometimes the oops comes along when you're like, there's no way that should have happened, and Johnny just pops out, and there he is, and you have to start being a parent. Kids don't come rolling right out with a little booklet that, says, here, it's this from God. Why don't you just figure me out? And you get to lead your kids through whatever that means as far as just raising them up. But you know what? God's given us his word. God's given us his word on what he wants for childhood and raising kids. Ephesians chapter 6. Paul has been working his way through what it means to be a a godly family. And he now is going to get to chapter 6, verse 1. He's worked through, husbands, you are to love your wives as Jesus loved the church. You're, you die for your wife. You die to your own self. Husbands, if you're not dying to your own self, you're actually not leading your home in the way that God has built you. God has built you to lead your home. You're a leader. You're already a leader. When you're born a male, you're built a leader. You might not feel like a leader. You might feel like a failure, but you're built a leader. You're built to lead your home. The issue isn't who is the leader of my home. The issue is how good is the leader of my home. Because the husband is already the leader of the home. But if you as a wife go, you know what, I'm going to take, take the reins of this, of this house and I'm going to kind of run this whole show, you've actually, what you've done is you've actually devalued your husband. And you've actually turned, you flipped the coin in your home and now your husband really, his role is pretty much just like breadwinner check bringer Homer. And what you've done is you've actually undermined the kind of marriage that you actually want, which is functional and healthy and supportive. 
so what, what Paul does here in chapter 5 is he says, here's how the home's supposed to work. Husbands, you love your wives like Jesus, God come in the flesh, has loved us. Which is Jesus, the ultimate leader, the ultimate man, the ultimate lover of humanity. He comes down to display ultimate love for, for, for us, his bride, metaphorically. We're the bride of, of Christ. He has come, he loves us, he dies for us, he gives himself on the cross. To save us, to make us who we need to be. Husband, in that same way, Paul says, you die to yourself. I know you could run rough over your house. I know. You're, you, if you were in an arm wrestling contest with your wife, you'd probably win. Congratulations. There are things about being a man that's just, that's, that's innate, that's built inside of you. But my thing to you this morning, guys, is that you have to love your, you have to love your wife, you lead her, she has to feel the greatest security with you. That your sexual, financial, emotional, mental, all the fidelity that you can muster belongs to her alone. She should never have a question about you or what you do on the weekends or in Vegas or overnight with the boys or whatever. She should have absolute con confidence in you. Because you're the leader of her home. And on the other side, ladies, you fall in line behind your husband. Not because you're not smart, not because you're not amazing. You might be amazing. But in order for there to be order in the home, God says, submit to your husband the way the church submits to Christ. Not because you're less, because you're equal in God's eyes, but in role, you take a supportive role. You're a helper to your husband. You're a helper. You make your home work. You make your home functional because you choose that role. Now we get to children. Children, you are to line up under your mother and father. If you're watching on the internet, line up under your mother and father. Obey. And that's where we get to in, in Ephesians 6.1. Ephesians 6.1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Verse 2, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Number one, what is God's design for children? Obedience. How many of you were obedient children when you were in your home? Caleb, put your hand down. I see it back there. You know, the reality is, watch this. Watch how hip hypocritical we are in our own mind. We go, hey, you know what, son? You better be obedient to me. But we look back in our own lives when we were like sneaking out the back door and, you know, out the window or whatever and, you know, letting ourselves down by rope from the third story uh, apartment we were in or whatever because we wanted to get out and run, out, run around with our friends. Here's the thing. You and I were built sinful creatures. And so, w watch this, watch. You and I, by nature, are rebellious. Even when I told you these things about men and women, you're like, I ain't, I ain't doing that. We are by nature rebellious. When I brought those things up, you're automatically the first thing in your head is like, forget that. We are by nature rebellion dwells inside of our hearts. It's so obvious that when you have a kid, you have to train them not to be selfish. You have to train them. That's probably not the best idea to smack Johnny in the face, Greg, and take his toy. All the way from birth through their teenage-ish, 20-ish, 30-ish, 40-ish years. We have to train our kids. Don't do that. You shouldn't have said that. Why are you looking at me like that? Why are you looking at me with that attitude? Did you just, we call it grump in our house. Did you just scrump your face at me? Which means that if we're talking to, to my son or whoever, and they go like this, that fit this face, like whatever, that whatever face. It's, rebellion dwells in your heart because you're a human, because you have a sinful nature. It's all about self, always, unless you break that inside of you. Unless God comes and transforms your heart, you will always be rebellious your whole life. You rebel against cops, you rebel against people that tell you what to do, against your employer, against me, against God's word, against, against what, what, 
whoever's over you, we automatically are rebellious. We put up our hand and go, no, no. Right here, Paul says, children, be obedient to your parents. You obey them. What it means is to line up under. You line up under your parents. For many of us, when we grew up in our home, man, we were, we were as rebellious as could possibly be. We didn't listen to anybody. To this day, we still don't listen. To this day, in our older ages, we still run away from, from instruction. And look what Paul says. Obedience. While in the home, children are to be fully obedient to their parents in all issues unless it is illegal or unbiblical. If your parents run a meth lab and you say, no, I don't want to do that, praise God for you. You're showing some discernment. I'm not saying do whatever your parents tell you. If it's illegal, immoral, unethical, unbiblical, you can say no, okay? Because the highest authority is who? The highest authority is God. It's not your parents, right? It's not even you. You don't even get to decide what's right. God decides what's right, right? And we line up underneath that. So what I'm saying here is it's not like whatever your parents say goes. But if it's not any of those things and it's just your personal preference, then you obey and line up under your parents. My wife says amen. Awesome. Obedience to parents was the only requirement in the law that included a blessing. And I love this in Exodus 20, verse 12, uh, that right in the law, God says, obey your parents. Obey your parents. I'm pointing right at you, young lady, yes. Mom's like, check him out right there. He's telling you what to do right now. This is the Lord speaking. Look, Exodus 20, verse 12, in the law that God gave to Moses for the nation of Israel, it says right here, honor your father and mother. What it means is respect. You give the highest honor to them. It means it's, 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 a, it's a Hebrew word that means that means, you, that means you lift them up in your eyes. Like it's a respect, it's an honor. You honor your father and mother. This is the only, of the Ten Commandments, this is the only commandment, not thou shalt not kill, not thou shalt not lie or steal or covet or love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, which, which he'll talk about later in, uh, in, in Exodus. None of these things come with a blessing except this one. This is the only command in all of the Ten Commandments or afterward that includes a blessing. You obey your parents that it may go well with you and that you can stay long in the land. You want to know why? Watch this. You're already checking out on me. You're like, I don't care about this. Watch this. This is why. Because God never blesses rebellion. God never blesses rebellion. In your heart and my heart, God will break the rebellion in your heart. God, God seeks after the rebellion and the pride in your heart. He goes after it, and he will set up scenarios in your life where you will become so frustrated until you are broken. And you go, you know what? I think God hates me. God doesn't hate you. God actually loves you like a responsible father. It's God, God in some ways, is the father to us that some of us never had. Some of us had to grow up on our own, right? Some of us had to grow up. Like dad left, and we didn't even know who our dad was. or He was abusive, and, and we didn't ever want to be like our father. So we're like, we'll do whatever it takes not to be like our dad. But here's the thing. What God does is he doesn't bail on us like our fathers did. What God does is he, he like a good father, molds us. And, and the way God works, unlike the way humans work, is that God uses experiences in your life to mold your character that you don't have any control over. You lose a job. You lose a kid. You car breaks down on the freeway. And you're like, but the one day I needed it to work. And you have to pull over, clunk, 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 and everybody's like waving to you as they drive by. The 14 million people on their way to San Diego or whatever on the 15, they're like waving to you, hey, have a great time because I'm going to work and you're not. You're like, why would God allow this? Why does God do this? Why did God allow that? Some things are hidden in the mystery of God, but I can tell you this. God, God will seek out the hardness in your heart. and He'll go after it and break it. That's why the Bible says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Because if God has to come humble you, things get bad. Right? I love it when I can humble myself and go, Jesus, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I need your help. Mold my heart. I want it, I want it to be soft. I don't want it to be, to be hard. That you have to break it to mold it. I want it to be soft so that you can mold it with your own hands. Right? But sometimes we start, we start getting like, it's pretty important around here pretty important in my job.
And God stands back and goes, hang on, whoa, 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 I'm seeing something bad, something, something weird's going on here. Hang on, hang on, time out, time out. And you're like, oh, no, I think I'm all about me right now. And God comes, and like a good father, he molds us. And this is exactly what Exodus is talking about 3,000 years ago when this was written. He goes, you honor your parents that it may go well with you in the land. I will bless you in this land. But if you rebel, I will break you. And that's exactly what we see in the history of Israel. God broke them over and over, sent people into their land. They got carted off by the Babylonians and Assyrians because they refused to be submissive to God. Even, watch this, even Jesus, who was God, was obedient to Joseph and Mary until he left the house. This is going to blow your mind. Ready? Turn to Luke. Turn back a couple books, books to Luke too. This may be something you've never even thought about. But if there's anybody that doesn't need to listen to mom and dad, who's it going to be? It's going to be Jesus, right? Ladies, if you have Jesus, if you have God come in the flesh, the incarnate son of God who has never been created but has always existed, creator of the universe, if he comes in flesh, pretty good chances Jesus doesn't have to listen to you, right? What are you going to tell the God of the universe? Now you put your bowl away. I knew you were going to say that. What do you, you know, like, what kind of parenting skills do you have to have to raise God come in the flesh? But look at, look at, look at the humility of God in the flesh. This is just so mind-blowing that when we think about our own kids, our two-year-old, our four-year-old, our 12-year-old, our 22-year-old, whatever, when we think about this as parents, or when we think back to when we were this age, we would think, if I was perfect, if I was morally perfect man like Jesus, I would never have to listen to anybody. And look, what, look in, uh, in Luke chapter 2, verse 48. Jesus has been presented at the temple, and then they go back to Nazareth. And uh, they bring Jesus to the, uh, back to the temple to, um, for the Passover. And so he's listening to the rabbis speak. And in verse 48, it says this. They're listening to Jesus teach. He's, he's 12 years old. Imagine a 12-year-old teaching uh, rabbis and, uh, and people being amazed at his ability to speak, which we would expect out of the Son of God. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, why have you treated us so? So what's happened here is that he's taught in the temple. They have now left Jerusalem. Jesus, they, they traveled in caravans back in Jesus' day. So a bunch of families would travel together for safety. And what would happen is... is you would lose your kids as you were leaving, that you'd expect them to like be with whoever, one of your family members. So you're leaving in this huge caravan, walking with camels and oxen and whatever else out of town. Jesus stays behind in Jerusalem, teaching at the temple. They, they lose Jesus. You ever lost your kid? Maybe on purpose? Like, where's Johnny? Never mind, get in the car. You ever lost your kid? I remember we lost Caleb in Ikea one time when he was like uh, three years old and he was like toddling around or whatever. And he, he, he had, I, I think he sat down on, on one of the couches in Ikea and we lost him. So, you know, Ikea is like a maze, right? You feel like a rat running through a maze of like furniture. Like, look at all this Swedish stuff. You like, keep walking around. You can spend hours in there. Well, anyway, we lose Caleb and we go into panic, full on panic mode. You know, the first thing that goes through your head when you're, when you're a parent is like, somebody stole him, he's going to, I'll see him on eBay for sale or whatever. I mean, all these crazy thoughts go through your head. Well, anyway, you know, we, through the help of uh, the people there at, at Ikea, that we, we found him and everything was great. But you wouldn't imagine the relief on our hearts when we actually found our son. So, Joseph and Mary leave. Jesus stays in Jerusalem. They're a, there's a, they're a ways down, and they, they, they realize Jesus is not with them. So they go back to Jerusalem to find him. They find him. And this is what Mary says in, um, in 48. And it's where, when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. Can you believe that? The Son of God demoted himself not only to become human, but actually demoted himself 
under his own creation to learn from them. Isn't that amazing? If that's not the ultimate level of humility, not only does God come in the flesh, but then he demotes himself below his own creatures to show the ultimate level of submission. From birth, children won't naturally do the right thing or follow God. So parents are to set clear boundaries for their home. Young parents in here, your kid will not follow God by osmosis. Do not think that, that, that your kid will just absorb sayings that you, the plaques you put around your home or whatever, or his bottle has like, fear the Lord your God or whatever on it. And somehow as he's drinking out of his bottle, he's like, I need to fear the Lord when I grow up. It's not going to work that way. You need to train your kid in how to follow the Lord. We do not naturally follow the Lord. That's what I'm telling you. There's an innate part of us that is rebellious from the day we are conceived. The soulish part of you will push away God, will push away authority, will push away everything that will cause obedience. Parents, you must raise your kids. They will not raise themselves to love Jesus. Many times Jesus will have mercy, like many of us that grew up without like solid parents, and God will come get you, which is great. But as parents, your job for as long as your kids are in the home is to train them in the fear of the Lord, that you, that God is our ultimate authority. We follow him. And when they see mom and dad working together to honor the Lord, they will by nature line up underneath you. Now, they may still be rebellious. They're still going to end up as a 13-year-old girl going, ah, okay. I'm not saying everything's going to be peachy keen. What I am saying, though, is that you have to honor Jesus first, and Jesus will honor your home. Not that there won't be rough times. There might be. But you've got to honor God first. Your kids got to see you honoring God. Obedience to authority isn't optional, and rebellion is never encouraged or blessed by God. We see that in Romans 13. Obedience creates order, and, and the desired behavior should ideally be modeled by the parents. You ever heard this? Do as I say, not as I do. You do as I say, not as I do. What if I said that to you as your pastor? Hey, you know what? You just do, I'm just going to, I'm not going to live what I'm actually preaching. I'm not going to live this, but I'm going to tell you to do it. No one in the world goes, that's okay. That sounds pretty good. I know you don't believe it, but it'll be okay for our family. No one does that, right? That's, there's a word for that. It's called hypocrisy, right? Who loves hypocrisy? No one. It's the worst thing in the world, right? You're like, why should I follow you? You can't even do it yourself, right? So as parents, don't say to your kids, don't lie, don't cheat, don't get angry, throw plates across the room. When you do all of those things, as the plate's flying across the room, don't do that, son. You have to model the behavior you want. You don't want your son to be violent? Don't hit your wife. You, don't, you want your daughter to dress appropriately? Don't walk around like you're 12 when you're 57. <laughs> hey, you have to model the behavior you want. Will it be perfect? Well, 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 is this some automatic perfection of, of like how to parent? Like if I do all these things, one, two, three, four, five, my kids will turn out like this? No, but what I'm saying is you can't ever have in your home the feeling of hypocrisy. Like mom and, what mom and dad are saying to me is not even what they believe because they don't live it. Right? Because we hated that in our own home. Why can't I drink? Dad gets drunk every night. Well, you're 16, son. Wait till you're 21. Then you can drink like me. Like, do you, really? Do you want your son or your daughter to follow that same path? No. What you want to do is stop that so you can say, there were things in my past I'm not proud of, son, but now I'm following Jesus. Jesus has redeemed my life. It's not about being perfect. It's about saying, I walk in grace now. And my son, my daughter, I want you to walk in grace too. I'm following Jesus as hard as I can, and I want you to run with me. Because our family's following Jesus. So I want you to follow me. The parent, parenting of a child is primarily caught, not taught. Do as I say, not as I do, does not work and is not biblical. Parents should not compete against one another 
but complete one another and give their best to God's kingdom. Like that video we saw? Don't you want to someday when your kids get married or when you finally kick them out of the nest? You want to be able to say on the day of their wedding or however that works out for you, you want to say to, to, the, to the bride or the groom, I did what you're, what you're seeing standing in front of you today is the best I could do. I gave you my best as a parent. You can't believe how many times I've stood up as a pastor and a beautiful couple walks down in front of me and I'm about ready to, to marry them. And, and, the, and the parents are so proud that even though they weren't perfect, their home wasn't perfect, but they said, you know what? We did everything we could to bring you to this moment and give you the best that we could. We did everything we could. Rather than saying, we were parents that just kind of checked out. And I just show up here because I got to pay the bill. When's, when's, when's our lunch? You want to say as a parent on the day of their wedding or however that is, I did the best I could. This is, this is, this is the outworking of the best parenting I could give you. Because watch this, ready? We make every decision based on two things, either what we feel is right for the moment or how we've been trained. You get to train your kids for 20 years. It's the longest amount of training that you will ever have in your whole life is the, is the amount of time you spend at home. Imagine your kids absorbing what it means to be a wife, absorbing what it means to be a husband, absorbing what it means to be a father or a mother. For those years, they get it just from you. Children are called to be obedient, and you're called to lead them in integrity. Do the best you can by the grace of God. Number two, honor. Children are called to respect and honor their parents both while living in their house and after leaving the house into their old age. Even if parents are not honorable or respectable, Christians are blessed when they give the same honor they would want to receive. I understand this. Listen, I understand that some of you have parents that you're like, I do not want to honor my parents at all. I understand that some of our parents are not honorable or respectable. I get it. But here's the thing. You want to always honor others the way you would want to be honored. So even though we have parents in our lives that maybe we don't want to honor at all, we have to honor them because God will bless us for our humility. It doesn't mean that we do everything that they want. Maybe they're really controlling. It doesn't mean we do everything for them, but we want to honor them just because God has placed us under their authority while we were in their home. and Maybe now we're not under their authority because we're outside the home right now, because we're older, we're adults, but we still honor them as our parents. We still bring them honor. We still treat them with respect. We still talk about them respectfully, even if they have not been respectful parents. God still calls you to honor your parents, even into your old age. In the Old Testament, an adult child would be put to death for parental respect a law that even Jesus supported. I want you to see this in Deuteronomy 21. Turn to the front of your Bible in Deuteronomy 21. I want you to see this crazy scenario. You may have never even seen this in the Bible before, but I want to show this to you in the law. Deuteronomy 21, 18. This is in the law that God says um, for for children, uh, this is adult children. So this isn't like your five-year-old that's running around the home. This is like an adult child. And look what happens here in verse 18. Uh, uh, 2118, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, you want to talk about uh, time out? Then his father and mother shall take a hold of him and bring him to the elders of his city at the gate of the place where he lives, and they shall say to the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. What? How's that for punishment? Some of us struggle with like, I wonder if I should give Johnny a time out. God cares so much about respect and honor that he would say to adult people, You are so lazy and dishonoring and disrespectful that he puts it in the law that if the parents go, I can't do anything with my son, he's absolutely retrobate. I can't can't make him into anything godly. It was in the law that they could take him to the gate of the city and that once the judges were like, yeah, you're right. He's been an alcoholic, hasn't taken care of his family, he hasn't done anything. He's just, he's lazy as can be. 
doesn't listen to his parents, totally rebellious. And they would stone him to death. And you kind of go, whoa, that's Old Testament. Oh, time out. Nobody would, nobody would really do that. Watch this. Watch this. From Jesus' own mouth in Matthew 15. Matthew 15. Matthew 15, the Pharisees and Sadducees, which were the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they, in order to get money for the temple or to support their own lifestyle, they would ease the restrictions on giving money. And so what would happen is if a child, if an adult child did not want to honor their parents or, or take care of them anymore in their retirement, uh, Maybe their parents were getting old and they lost all their money and now you have a, a, maybe a, a guy like myself in your 30s or 40s and he has a job, he's able to take care of his elderly parents but he doesn't want to for whatever reason, he hates them or he just wants to spend all the money on himself. What he could do is he could say, now my money is given to the Lord. So anytime you say, now it's, something is, is dedicated to the Lord, now that's its, its, its sole focus belongs to God. I don't have to do anything else with it. So th- because the Pharisees allowed that, Jesus is going to rebuke them right here. Look how he does it in Matthew 15. Then the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They do not wash their hands when they eat. And he said to them, And why do you break the tradition of God for the sake of your, uh, the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles or disrespects or dishonors your father and mother shall surely die. And that's just what I read to you. If you disrespect, dishonor your father and mother, when you are old enough to know the difference in your adult years, you shall surely die. Verse 5, but if you say, if anyone tells his father and mother, what would you have gained from me is now given to God. He, is not, uh, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. And I want you to understand this. God expects you to, to honor your parents, even when they're unhonorable. For many of us, dealing with our parents is the, is the deepest hurt of our hearts. But it's what God expects, because you expect to be respected. You expect to be honored. And so we should do that for our parents as well. It doesn't go away until they're dead. Number three, training. Children are to be obedient. Children are to be honorable and honoring to their parents. And number three, training. Children are a gift from the Lord, but must be trained in word and deed to follow him. A parent's goal is not to insulate and isolate their children from the world, but rather to help them discern and discriminate while in the world. As parents, I don't want you to like wrap your kids up in bubble wrap and hope that they don't get hurt out in the world. Because for many parents, it's like, I gotta isolate my kids from the world. I'm gonna put them in a rubber room. Maybe some of your kids need to be in a rubber room. But as far as like having them influence from the, from the world, we just don't want any influence. Understand, you're... Your kids are going to be in the world. Your kids are going to be leaders. They're the future wives and husbands and leaders. You need to make sure that they're not just insulated from the world, but they actually have discernment while they're in the world. So what you want to do is you want to build godly discernment into your kids. Have you been building godly discernment into your children? How to make the right choice. When There, there are many times that it's total rebellion that you need to stop. But there are many times your kids are just growing up. And you need to be able to say to them, hey, you think that was the best choice? I know Johnny does this or I know Jenny does this. But do you think that would be honoring to our family if you went and did that? That's what I try to do with my own son. As I say, hey, there's something special about being part of our family. What, what, What you're thinking about doing, I know everybody else is doing it. I know they're listening to that or dressing this way or whatever. But do you think that that would be honoring to our family and ultimately to Jesus? Because what I want to do is I want to build discernment in him that when he's my age and he has his own kids, that I have modeled to the best of my ability what I'm actually talking about. And that when he looks back at his time under me, under my authority, that it's not a matter of like, that was a total hypocrite, he never did what he said. And number two, that he didn't just isolate me from the world so that I didn't know what the true world was about, but he actually taught me to have discernment inside the world that the Holy Spirit has given me discernment to be able to decide what is right and true for me. Are you helping your kids build discernment? Do you think that's the best music we should be listening to? I love that because sometimes it's the, it's the fight between secular and holy or whatever. And it's like, there is no secular and holy. It all belongs to Jesus. What you need to do is discern 
what is right in these songs or what is wrong. Like when Miley Cyrus puts her thing out or whatever, and you just go, what in the world? Jesus Almighty, have mercy. What is, our, what is happening to our world? But you know what? It's an opportunity for me, because you can't get away from popular media things. They just go, you know what? What do you think about this? Is this right? You think this honors God? Or do you think she's totally lost? You know what? Probably kind of lost that. Yeah. Things like this come from a broken heart, not from a place of health. And I want to build discernment inside of my son. Because I know someday he'll have to be discerning for his own child. Because sin is bound up in the heart, loving, appropriate, consistent correction is required. In Proverbs 13, 24, um, I, I, I love this verse because it actually talks about spanking. And um, maybe you're not a spanker. When I was growing up, uh, my dad uh, rearranged my butt many times. And, um, and I love Proverbs 13, 24. Whoever spares the rod actually hates his son. You will hate your children if you do not lovingly correct them. And sometimes it's going to have to be physical. Some kids don't have to be spanked. My, my sisters, all, yeah, all, all my dad had to do was go do, do this. I grew up with like a, a lot of girls in the home. We had, uh, everything was female in my home, including the dog. And so I had, uh, so I grew up with a lot of estrogen and I was like, wow, what's going on here? And so I, I, I saw in, in my dad's own discipline the difference between me as the only son and all the other daughters in the, in the home. That all my dad had to do was go like this. Like, ah. But me? Oh, man. My dad could be calling for me. Hey, hey, come here. Hey, come here. I'm like, I'm going to beat your butt red if you don't get over here. I don't think so. If you can catch me, old man. And he caught me. Sometimes... Sometimes, the hand of correction to the seed of understanding brings about godliness, and it did for me, because I had, I had wickedness bound up in my heart, and the rod of correction drove it away from me, because watch this, not every child has to be corrected like this. Part of the skill of being a parent is understanding what your children need, Right? Your daughter's not going to be like your son, like your other daughter, like your other son. It, part of the skill of parenting is it's not one size fits all. But you're going to have some really rebellious kids, and you're going to have some really, really obedient kids. And you, as a skill of a parent, must discern by, by, God's, by God's wisdom what's appropriate for every situation. For me, I needed the belt. I needed, the, I needed a smack because my heart was so bound up and like, you're not going to tell me what to do. I'm a grown 12-year-old. Oh, really? I know what's going on. I've been around this world a decade and a couple other years. Proverbs 22, 15. Folly, and in, in, in the proverb is, and the writer of the proverb is saying foolishness. It's, 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 it's choosing whatever you feel is right for the moment. It's that, it's that wild kid that they just say is ADD, and he just goes crazy, and, and he just does whatever's right for the moment. He runs over here, and he screams, and he grabs a crayon and sticks it in a girl's eye or whatever. I mean, this is the idea of folly. It's just the, whatever's right for the moment. It's chasing after whatever, whatever, whatever. What, what, what's going to make me happy right now? And this, that's exactly what he's saying. It's this folly or foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. It's like a knot. It's like that, like a Gordian knot or the, 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 the yarn that's all bound up. It's like you can't, you can't even figure out how to get it untied, how to get a certain string or a certain part of the yarn out because it's so bound up. It says, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will remove it or drive it from him. And I want you to see this this morning. God has given you the authority in your home not to abuse your kids, but to actually raise them in the, in the admonition, the fear of the Lord. They need to come under your authority. If you have rebellion in your home, that it's not a home that's honoring God. Guys, don't rebel against your role to lead and love your home. Ladies, don't rebel against your role to love and support your husband. Children, don't rebel against your role to, to follow your, your, the instruction of your parents. While you're in their home, you are under their authority. When you leave their home, you get to start your own home, and you have your own authority. 
but we still honor and respect our, our parents, though we're not under their authority anymore. That's why it says you leave your father and mother and start your own home. Discipline like spankings, timeouts, loss of privileges, etc., should never be so harsh that it produces bitterness and rebellion. Again, you do not want to do it so that your kids go, this is over. This is way too harsh. For many of us that grew up in a, in a home that was really hard and harsh, sometimes we swing the pendulum way back over and we, we, don't, even, we don't even discipline our kids, right? Because our dad was so harsh and overbearing, we're just like, I don't ever want that in my home or my kids to think that way about me. So we just kind of let the reins of the home go and like the kids just kind of do the folly, the foolishness, they're doing whatever they want and that's not right either. You must come under the authority of Christ and lead your home and discipline your home correctly. Some kids won't even need much discipline. Some kids will need a lot. With the wisdom from God, you'll be able to lead your home. Children get most of their cues about their worth, sexuality, choosing of a mate, and God's character from their fathers. You know what's tough about this? Is uh, the majority of kids that I see that struggle with homosexuality, uh, actually without, without um, this has never not been true, put it this way, in almost 20 years when I've sat down with with young women who are like, I think I'm a lesbian, or a guy's like, you know, I'm attracted to men or whatever. Uh, every single time, friends, every single time, and I'm not saying this is true of everybody that uh, is choosing homosexual lifestyle, what I'm saying is of everyone that I've ever counseled with this, 100% of the time, there's never been a healthy relationship with their father, ever. I'm not saying everybody that doesn't have a healthy relationship with their father will choose homosexuality. What I'm saying is that for those that, that, that are in that lifestyle, they have never, ever had a positive, enduring relationship with their, with their father. There's been abuse there. There's been neglect. There's been just crazy stuff that's happened. And I'm not saying it's true in every case, but what I'm saying is the major, every case that I've ever been a part of, that's been true. And, and here's my point. Fathers, if you're a father in the home right now, everybody takes their cue off of you. Everybody does. Your wife will, will judge her, her value based on how you lead the home. Her beauty, is she going to have to look for it from another guy? Somebody else to say you're beautiful? Somebody else to say I love you? Or is she going to draw it from her husband? Is she going to be able to drink from the well of her home from her own husband? The, the, the kids, most of their self-worth is like, what, am I, what is my value? Young ladies, if they don't find it from their father and go, you are beautiful no matter what. I love you no matter what. You are my daughter. You are my special flower in this world. I love you. And they don't feel that security from their father. They'll go find it in another young man that'll tell them what they want to hear. Right? Some of us young ladies, that was true of us. And the guys go, what does it even mean to be a man? Because I don't know what it means for my father. Everybody looks the father is the, is, the, is the captain of the home. Everybody looks to him for order. Everybody looks to him for value. Everybody looks to him for what is my sexual orientation. How, how should I be as a young lady? My dad doesn't seem to care. Or if there's been abuse in the home, she's like, oh, you know what? I'm giving up on men. I'm going to try being with women. Same thing with guys. It's like, I don't even know what it means to be a man. And so they, they grow up in, in certain ways and, and, they, and they choose a, uh, to go down a path and they go, I must be a homosexual because this is the way I feel. Guys, you are so vitally important. Ladies, you are so vitally important. Raise your kids up so that they know they are loved, that the home is the most secure, safest place for them to learn about God and to learn what it means to be a man or a woman. Children get most of their cues about their worth, sexuality, choosing of a mate, and God's character from, from their fathers. Parents should not parent out of guilt from the past or fear of the future, but God's presence for the present. And, that, and I just want to touch on that. Hey, if, you have, if you've had a rough past or whatever, and you're like, hey, I, I don't want to, my kids to go through this like I just said, don't parent out of fear from the past. and go, oh, I can't do these things. You do exactly what God tells you to do. If your parents didn't raise you correctly, then you say, these are the things that God wants for us. He wants obedience in the home. He wants honor in the home. 
and we are going to train you to love God. You don't have to worry about the future. You don't have to worry about the past. You are in the present with God's presence in your home. And he will help you become the best woman, the best man, the best husband, the best wife, the best spouse that you can possibly be because the Holy Spirit has built you for godliness. The majority of the training of a child should primarily involve verbal and physical love and encouragement. When is the last time you got some encouragement at home? Because for many of us, watch this, for many of us, we can't remember the last time our dad ever sat us down and went, you know what, son, I love you. We, we're just like, that's like, foreign, you're speaking a foreign language, father. I can't understand. Watch, because many of us didn't have fathers that were emotionally available. Right? Many of us grew up like, I don't even know what, it, is a father even supposed to be encouraging? Watch. I had to break this in my own life. Let me tell you how personal this is. I had to break this in my own life. My father was not that way. God bless him. He did everything he could to raise me correctly. But the one thing that was tough for me is I, I can count on maybe one hand how many times my father ever sat me down and go, you know what? I love you. I appreciate you. I see what God's doing in your life. He's doing awesome things. I'm so proud of everything that's going on in your athletics, in your academics, the way you knit that dog sweater the other day. I mean, whatever you do, you do awesome. I can't even remember time. And so I've tried to correct that in my own home because you know what? The way you've been trained in your home is, the, is what you'll do in your, own, your own home, right? The violence that you saw is the violence you're, you'll, you'll do. Again, the way you saw your mother being treated is the way you treat your own wife. So you must break that. You've got to break that in your own home. By the power of God, you can break that. And one of the major things I would say is you've got to take your kids up into your arms. You've got to pull out your lazy boy, turn off Sports Center, put your schlitz down, and have your kids come and sit, sit on your lap and go, you know what? I love you. I want to affirm you that you're my son. You've got my DNA, and I'm sorry that sucks for you. But Jesus gave you to me. Jesus gave you to me. And I want, you to, I want you to know that I am so honored to be your parent. If you're in a mixed home where you've got kids from different marriages or whatever, hey, you say, you know what, I know I'm not you know, your real father or whatever, but I just want you to know that I see greatness in you. I want to encourage you and love on you. That, that, that I just, I believe in you. I believe that God has something good for your life. Right? Because don't we all want to hear that? And I'm not saying there doesn't need to be hard conversations at home. There's times where there needs to be some yelling and some spanking going on. I'm, you know, I just got done saying that. But what I'm saying is that doesn't need to be every day, right? Man, the tenor of your home should be encouragement overall, right? Because we all love to come home to, like, functional, peaceful encouragement, right? Don't we love that? So why can't our homes be like that? Why do our homes have to be this, like, drudgery? Your homes don't have to be like that. There's nothing written on the wall like, when you get married, it's going to suck. Okay. Well, I guess it's on the wall, so I guess our home just has to really be lame. So everybody yell at one another, and we'll get really angry and deal really dysfunctionally. There's no written law. In fact, it's supposed to be the opposite way. If there's order in your home, there can be peace. Right? And if there's peace, there should be encouragement. I love you. I appreciate you. It's the same thing God does for us. We're not perfect, but God still loves on us. Lastly, support. And this is going to deal with adult children. Though children leave the authority of their parents when they leave the home, the command to adult children to honor their parents while they still live still continues. A child is to never allow his responsible parents to become destitute if it is within their ability to help them. Adult children are to support their parents if they need help in their older age and pay back the years their parents have invested in them. In 1 Timothy 5, 4 through 8, I'm not going to turn there, but I'm going to reference it. In 1 Timothy uh, 5, 4 through 8, he actually tells the adult children, do not neglect your, your family. Do not neglect your older parents. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for the members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And in verse 16, he talks about the fact that you should be striving to pay back your parents. Some of us older people are like, awesome, get a good job, son. Sign that signing bonus so we can move to Malibu or whatever. Hey, you know what? It's one of the reasons we got the house we did, because I know that we may have to be taken care of 
um, our elderly parents in the future. We got too much house for the three of us, but not if there's going to be five. The point is I'm looking ahead because I realize I want to honor God with what the parents he gave me, right? I didn't choose my parents. You didn't choose yours. God chose that for us, whether it was we thought it was a great time or not a great time. But the point is, as they get older, you do your best to be an honorable husband or wife in your own home to honor your parents, whether they were honorable or not. Because God will, here's the point, and I wrap up on this. God will bless you. God will, watch, watch. I wrap this whole thing up here. Ready? If there's humility in your heart, God knows the hurt and the pain that you've gone through, okay? God knows it. I'm not saying let's just forget about it. What I'm saying is God already knows it. If you humble yourself to honor your parents in their old age and take care of them to the best of your ability, God will honor you. God will honor your home. I'm not saying that you do things for your parents if they're like living a way that you don't appreciate. You don't take care of sinful issues. What I'm saying is you also don't abandon your parents either in old age. That's the parents God gave you. So when you honor them, you're actually honoring God. Children, be obedient. Children, honor and respect your parents. Children, be trained in your home to love God. And lastly, you're supposed to support your parents as they get older. Because that's what God expects of you. And I, I put two books at the bottom here which are two great books. One is by MacArthur, Successful Christian Parenting. The other one is Trip, um, Shepherding a Child's Heart. If you really need help in your parenting, I would uh, suggest these books. Let's all stand.